As more people get logged on, um, we'll go ahead and get started. I would love to turn it over and um, make some intros really quick. Let Christy kind of take it from here. Oh, Hannah's on also. I would love to hear from Hannah today um, over in the chat in Czech, Czech Republic. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Wow. I'm trying to do too many things at once. So Christy, I'll go ahead and let you, if you'd like to do an intro, um, tell us a little bit about what you're working on and kind of um, how this, how this last season went or, or some of the, the information that you learned or knowledge that you've acquired. And then um, we'll kind of break it up a little bit and open this up for opportunity to ask questions. Hannah, I was just saying, I'd love to hear from you and how things are going for you as well. Um, but Christy, go ahead. I'd love to turn it over and we'll just kind of get started. For those of you that do have questions, you can raise your hand or add them to the chat and we'll just, um, yeah, engage today. So go ahead, Christy. Hello everybody, I'm Christy Apple. Thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to uh, take a few minutes, as Mandy mentioned, to introduce myself and in, in my role in the industrial hemp space. I'm physically located in Michigan, in central Michigan. And I work directly with farmers all over the Midwest, in fact, developing nutrient management plans, IPM plans, and other agronomy, um, agronomic considerations for many different crops, mostly on the specialty crop side, including grapes, orchards, um, all kinds of specialty fruits and vegetables. I got my start, though, in the row crop world, um, so in, in the agronomy field. Um, my husband and I and a business partner built a business along with a, a great team of people servicing farmers in the mid-Michigan area in the agronomic services realm, including custom application, um, soil sampling recommendations, nutrient management application, that type of thing. Um, so my background um, in that is, is, is rooted there. And in 2019, I was introduced um, to opportunities to do those things for hemp farmers. But in 2019, there was a bit of a CBD craze kicking in full effect. And so there was, uh, there was some limitations in what we could really do for the farmer in creating medicine um, at that time. And so in, in our region, the industrial hemp space looked predominantly like cannabinoid production. Um, so when we got access or when I was introduced to the Midwest Hemp Council in that season, um, it really opened my eyes to this other side of the world um, that was really cannabinoid production being just a teeny tiny little piece of that hemp pie. And so um, really encouraging and exciting to be able to dive headfirst into that realm. And so for the last, you know, since 2019, um, about midway through that season, I've been working in the fiber and grain space as well um, on the industrial hemp side. So I worked really hard to, to learn as much as I could about the plant, about the plant root interactions and the soil structure. Um, There's a lot of anecdotal evidence um, suggesting that there was some soil health implications there. And so I really set about to uh, prove or slash disprove um, do some myth busting, and then also help farmers to um, kind of figure out systems, um, agronomic systems that worked for production of hemp on scale. A uh, one acre industrial hemp farm with fiber is not scale. Um, what, what do we need? And so through my journeys and adventures, I learned deeper um, and more and, and more in tune with what industry was looking for, um, for fiber quality, um, different components of that plant that could be used for different things, um, built some really wonderful relationships in the industrial hemp space. Um, I see a few friendly faces on this call here. Um, hey, Drew. <laughs> um, just, just wanted to kind of share sort of where I'm coming from. Now, some of the things that I've been doing more recently are really mostly just dispose within the soil health space, particularly in regenerative hemp farming scenarios. And so my passion to introduce industrial hemp to mainstream agricultural clients, large scale row crop farmers that can produce the scale we need 
to be able to um, generate the R&D material that we need with enough consistency that we need, that an end use application will be feasible. And so this is kind of where I'm, you know, where I'm operating within the industrial hemp space. I also work extensively in the, the marijuana side of the cannabis production world um, as well, again, in the nutrient management, pest management, um, and, um, and soil quality and soil health systems. So I guess I'll leave that there and you guys can start firing away questions at me. I don't know, Mandy, what's next or how you wanna to continue to proceed here? Yeah, so I will definitely open it up for questions. With that being said, Hana, I don't know if you would like to make an intro real quick about what you're doing and what you've worked on and maybe some of your advancements with opportunity for seeds here in the US. Um, and then just kind of give an opportunity to drop drop questions in. And then I would love to hear about maybe the pest, pest management and some um, other specific topics, Christy, when, when Hana's done. Hana, go ahead. Okay. And hi. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so I, I I have a company called Hempoint and we supply last like six years uh, the US hemp farmers, the certified EU uh, varieties, which are well uh, like stabilized and like used like more than 30 years for like fiber and grain production in Europe. So not they are not suitable for all of the states in the US, of course, because of the like latitude. Uh, but like for the northern states or like Midwest states, they are for sure suitable. And we put them in some Midwest trials this year for like trialing them in the like five universities plus Rodel Institute is trialing them. So in the end of this year, we should have some very good data for the farmers, but I'm very excited. And uh, the most important uh, for the farmers to say it's uh, the timing because um, as you probably know, to get seeds to US from Europe, uh, like freight, air freight nowadays, forget about that. It's just like so expensive. Uh, the freight for, of the pallet from 600 euro in 2016, it was like sending pallet to Washington states from Europe, 600 euro, one pallet, one ton. Now, 5,000 euro. Uh, so uh, probably nothing really interesting for anybody. But good news is that we we uh, putting together the, the joint venture kind of project. So we will be able to, we are like now organizing shipping of the container. Uh, of the European varieties to be able to distribute the seeds uh, in US for all the like American farmers, the shipment will happening from North Carolina and Tennessee. So we will be able to supply the, the seeds American farmers from US. So not everybody has to do deal with the shipments, all the phytosanitary documents, uh, and there will be like possible like order the seeds from, from, from US for the American farmers. And plus we have like nice also kind of group who will be doing the consulting because we are like experienced, not only me as a farmer, but there is like this Bert James Farmer from North Carolina. I, I hope like ben, Mandy will be able to meet him when she yes. does that. And, and there is the, the, the Corbett McTiff guy who is like from Tennessee, who is also like very well uh, experienced. He worked closely with this like Hempwood guys. Hempwood, <laughs> my next mission. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so I'm excited. This is like a really cool project. So, and uh, I just want to say that like why European seeds maybe, I know that like many people trialing the this Chinese seeds or Australian seeds. I just want to keep in mind that um, like Australia has a 1% uh, like limit for the THC. So even if this variety grows well, they are not certified. I, I, I check it like in, 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 in Australia, <laughs> like uh, Paul Benheim, who is like really well connected Australian like entrepreneur. If, if he knows about like registered hemp seed varieties in Australia, he said like no, Hannah, I think there yet, because of course this process of registration seeds, it's not it's it costs time. It's like developing the variety, stabilizing the variety. It's like <coughs> selection, proper selection. It's like at least like fifteen years process. Yeah, so this is why Europe is so ahead. 
And uh, also these Chinese varieties, I, I tried many times officially import the Chinese varieties somewhere else of the world. And there's like not 100% like government approved. So it's like somebody can sell you the seeds, but it's not officially <laughs> government <laughs> approved. Uh, so they, they really protecting like not, not uh, sell officially the seeds from China. So this is why I don't offer them. And also the, the they, they can grow well in, in, in US, but again, this is like not really <laughs> officially uh, like uh, established way. Maybe somebody that, that does that, but I ask like the officials from the like breed, breeders and they said, no, we cannot because like government didn't agree on that to sell them abroad. So European varieties can be shipped to US, no problem. They are stabilized with 0.2 THC. So they, they probably never go hot at all. And, and they are really like monoecious, uh, which is also like making them like very stable for harvest. So, and the most important is that like order them sooner than later. So if somebody interested, I can send you the catalog and I will place here the email and I can connect you with our folks if you have some more question or we do consulting included in our price. So we are very happy to help farmers be successful. And it's not only about like, you know, like selling the seeds, but we really want to sell the seeds to the farmers who really want to do it the good way. And we want to help them. So we have like nice guides for the farmers, Britain and so on. So yeah, so this is a little bit overview oh. and like sooner than later. Yeah, because we're shipping the container one now and the next shipment will be probably in January. And it takes really two months to get it there in March. And, and then if somebody ordered them in March and expecting us to be in time, like- It's not working. <laughs> no, no, no. Get, out, get out early. Okay, well, I will definitely- really two, two months, two I'll months be in touch them. with um, Bert and make sure that we connect and are able to help facilitate this. And so if there are questions, Hannah, I would love to um, really help, especially as the discussion for next season is really at the top of people's you know, mines for next planting season. But I saw Isaac, um, you were able to get logged in. Are you, I would love to hear from you and make an intro real quick and then go back to questions. Um, Christy just gave a quick intro um, as an agronomist and has been doing tons with the soil health this last um, season. And then Hannah just did, gave a quick intro. I'm not sure if you were able to hear that, but Isaac, welcome. And I love an intro about who you are and what you're working on. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Isaac Cohen. I'm the president of the cultivation division of Santa Fe Farms. Santa Fe Farms is a um, company out of, obviously, its name, Santa Fe, New Mexico, that today is vertically integrated across the, the entire hemp spectrum. So I started my hemp venture, if you will, with High Grade Hemp Seed, a genetics company that Santa Fe Farms acquired in 2021. Um, and I see Drew Kitt wearing a nice t-shirt there. So high five on that one. Um, but at the same time, you know, kind of a little bit before, a little bit after Santa Fe has acquired now a few different companies encompassing both the testing side of things. So Rio Grande Analytics, one of the certified labs in New Mexico, and then high grade, as I mentioned for the genetics piece, and then really two different farming components, um, one of them out of New them out of Colorado. So today, you know, kind of encompass both of those genetics and the farmings. And that is the vision of Santa Fe Farm. And then our other two divisions are our processing division that handles just that, all the processing needs and you know, in the name. I would say high grade hemp seed is all very focused in the cannabinoid market at first. And as of the last two years, we've, you know, put a lot of our focus more now in the industrial side of this equation. But Santa Fe in general does plan on continuing, you know, having call it us in both races. Um, you know, the industrial side to us today is again, like I said, from an R and D, from the genetic side all the way through, a big, big part of our focus. Um, and then last but not least, we have an advanced carbons division that's handling all the amazing stuff when it comes to the carbon side of this story, 
and including obviously the carbon offsets coming off from the farms. Last little thing, just intro wise, prior to the hemp industry, which I started in 2018, I spent 12 years in the protein animal agriculture industry. So my family and my father um, all had spent their entire careers um, very specifically in the poultry industry. So that's kind of where I have my passion for agriculture and really trying to see, you know, this, this amazing plant make it through here, this uh, very, very funny stage. But as we all know, it's, it's got some amazing benefits for this planet. So I'll kind of stop there. Okay, well, Christy and Isaac and Hannah, if you, for anybody that's new to Zoom or hasn't been logged on, um, I know a lot of us try to avoid it. <laughs> I will just suck you in if I have a chance, but um, you can move your uh, screens or your little cubes where people are speaking around. So you can add the guest speakers up to the top or you can um, up in the upper right-hand corner, change the view of the screen so you can actually see your speaker. But I'd love to turn it over for Christy and Isaac and Hannah to talk about potentially their season this year. And what are some things that you found that may be new discoveries within the um, this season specific compared to last year? And Christy, if we can start with you, I know that you really, you had a number of different um, clients or customers, clients, farmers that you work with. I don't know what we call them, but yes all of the farmers in different test plots. And so, yeah, I'd love to kind of hear more specific about what you found and how it might help us. Sure, and Mandy, um, just so you know, I do consider my the farmers that I work with my clients, they're trusting yes. me for a service. They deserve my utmost um, respect. And um, and also a client is, is somebody that I feel like we, we need to continually earn yeah. their trust and continually build that relationship. So I adopted the term client a long time ago and it's just kind of stuck for me. But anyway, that's a that's a topic for another day. Um, so on the research and, and development side of things, doing the agronomy gig, you know, I spend a lot of my time either in front of a computer or out in the field. And um, and a lot of times the the what we're doing or what we're looking to learn is like I mentioned earlier, we're trying to prove or disprove that something is working in, in certain scenarios. Um, one of the big challenges that I was, was tasked with this year, one of my clients is actually a materials company and they were desperately seeking a certain amount of quality fiber. And um, they were very curious to see, you know, they wanted to take a look at a couple different varietals. They wanted to look at different cropping scenarios. And so, what we were able to accumulate was to convince a few farmers to join in and buy into this mission um, that this plant, which none of them had grown before, was worthy of much, much more than what they had originally expected. And so I, uh, I, I took on the, the role of facilitating and helping to integrate into their system, the cultural practices to adapt hemp into their rotation. Even though it was on a very small scale, we had some important questions to answer for these farmers who are, uh, you know, number one, they're businesses. And so we need to keep them in business. Otherwise, there's really no point of any of us sitting here if we don't have farmers that are going to be producing this crop, right? And so um, one of the biggest questions that I ran into is, well, how should we plant it? Then the next question was, how do, what do we do during the season? And the next question was, what, what you know, crop protection products are, can we use on this? And, 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 in, and even to how do we know when it's mature enough and how do we harvest it? And then what do we do with it? And who hauls it and all of the rest of the things. And so those aren't, you know, only a handful of those were really agronomically specific. But what I realized in that moment was in order to, to introduce a new crop into a farmer's rotation and helping them feather it into their current cultural practices, there's a lot of information that we needed to sort out and doing the varietal vetting was a bit was a big a biggest the biggest concern that I had especially after seeing what 19 and 20 brought us in terms of inconsistency in germination and seed size I, I those were really important questions that we needed to get sorted out and so we worked with another company and collaborated there um, on sorting out what we we're going to use in terms of genetics and I was really comfortable with what we put in the ground. Now we also had farmers that were in these different tillage structures and tillage practice systems. One was completely no-till. Their farm hasn't been tilled in 37 years. The others were full tillage and some different soil textures where we had muck, we had sand soils, we had all kinds of different variation, which could potentially impact 
the, you know, everything along the way, right? Everything from water drainage and water infiltration to nutrient exchange and nutrient accessibility to one of the most important things that I was focused on, so quality and soil health. And we were really interested, interested in the carbon conversation. And so we piggybacked an additional research project on top of those five locations to actually study what kind of impact we were making in terms of carbon sequestration, um, you know, microbial interactions, particularly on the, the fungi to bacteria balances. A lot of our common agriculture land that is being farmed in production systems that are conventional tillage along with modern pesticide use tend to be more bacterial dominated and less fungally dominated. And so um, I'll give you a little teaser, something I won't need to send everybody an NDA on, um, is the fact that with the industrial hemp crop, we were able to conclude that we were significantly recovering fungal activity in these farms, which maybe some of the people on this call might find that that completely out of context and have no way to understand what that means but for somebody like me it makes me like squeal with joy because that tells me that our industrial hemp plant exudates were and root structure were giving off the right signals to encourage fungal to recover in those scenarios so even in our no-till farm that we were looking at, we also saw an increase in fungal balancing um, on the fungal to bacterial balances. That's, I'll just say at a high level, what that means is better balance in fungal to bacterial means better water infiltration, nutrient exchange, soil resiliency, less diseases, and less space and opportunity for weeds to flush in where we don't want them. So we did have lots of weeds, but we don't have herbicides that are technically labeled for this. So that actually pre prevented the farmer from applying something that season onto that farm. And in my opinion, that gives that farm a break for the soil recovery component, right? So if we can take a year off of pesticide use to that farm and give that farm a chance to recover, that's awesome. We also took a look at utilizing industrial hemp for not just our purposes of, of fiber in, in, the, in the multiple uses of that. I was really interested uh, and we did a trial where we brought a crimper to the field and we crimped the hemp. And we did it a little later than what we had planned, but it was a, 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 an on the fly field demonstration. And I'm really excited to say that hemp is still laying down and suppressing weeds now. And it's been nearly two months that, that, that those young hemp plants were laid down. Now they're, they're field reading. The crimper actually creates these little creases in the, um, in the exterior of that. I honestly believe that there's some really usable material that is laid down there. Um, and it's also serving the purpose of suppressing weeds, which is very important. We are harvesting grain out of that field somewhere in that middle of August timeframe. And now we have like three months maybe even three and a half months of really nice fall weather where seeds that have dropped might germinate. So this crimping thing and where this idea of using the crimper came from was in a regenerative farming scenario or an organic farming scenario where weed suppression is, is key, we may be able to use this as, as a secondary use. So our volunteer hemp, the seeds that fell out of our, out of our flowers at the top of our grain or hemp um, fiber plant, have a purpose as well. They germinated, they started growing, we crimped them. We're curious to see how long they'll suppress the weeds. So there's lots of different things going on that we're studying here. And from a cultural practice perspective, putting myself in the seat of the farmer, it was really, it was really great to have the farmers out there to be able to see what that is capable of. They're looking at cover crops in different ways now, which is, um, which is a, a fantastic way to start recovering um, carbon in your farming system. Every time you till the soil, you're breaking apart that soil structure and releasing carbon. And so if we can utilize something that we didn't have to, you know, all the, we had was the crimper and the tractor on that. Those were volunteer seeds that weren't going to be harvested. They'd already fallen out anyway. So I was really excited to see, I don't know, there's some interesting implications there. And I don't know how, how much deeper to really get into it, but I was very excited to see some of that. Um, 
there might be some questions that we have here. We also grew in a muck soil scenario. And when I say muck, I'm talking an extraordinarily high organic matter scenario. I'm talking like 28% organic matter. And why that's significant is in those very high soil organic matter scenarios, what happens in the soil structure is nutrients jump on and pop off, on and off the soil colloid so quickly that frequently the nutrients are not accessible by the plants. Um, and it's also very susceptible to leaching and to water events. And so what we were seeing with the industrial hemp in that particular farm was um, some water infiltration differences. And we had a couple of really odd rain events where we had a lot of ponding, where there was some compaction in a specific area of the field, but where we had the hemp and where the hemp had emerged in later rain events, we actually saw excellent weed suppression. We had virtually no competitive weeds underneath the canopy. We had absolutely magnificent root structures, the roots that were, I mean, we had 12 foot tall plants and we had roots that were up to two foot wide. Those roots were, were, ex, were experiencing and, and exploring a ridiculous amount of soil. And I think that they were accessing nutrients because they had so much root mass there to actually physically do that. And so subsequently, when I was soil sampling later in the season, I pulled up a whole bunch of mycorrhizal wetting right along with one of the roots that I had pulled up. And I was really encouraged to see that. So again, the mycorrhizal is a fungal body that's responsible for pulling nutrients to the root system and making them accessible for the plant. In fact, even holding on to things until the plant signals for them in this beautiful symbiosis type of scenario. So we saw some really, really cool things this year. And you know, beyond, beyond letting the cat out of the bag on specific things, we definitely saw an improvement in, in soil quality and soil health. We have yet to get the final results on what that means in terms of carbon sequestration, but we have enough preliminary data to prove that if a farmer were to plant industrial hemp, they most certainly would qualify for some type of carbon incentive of some kind if they should choose to go down that path. Um, but moreover than that, the implications of, of the carbon sequestration and the soil quality of improvements with the soil microbes um, that's tremendous in terms of um, environmental stewardship. So wherever you're at on the spectrum of why you're growing hemp, there's these other really beautiful benefits to the environment, to the soil, to the waterways that we need to protect in order to continue farming them long-term. Okay, I love this. <laughs> I know that I saw a lot of your eyes perk up as she was speaking. So um, Isaac, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, I concur a million percent, and and part of part of Santa Fe's mission is is this this level of both the just to say education, and some of it tends to be a little expensive, right? Just the trial and error, if you will, and and some of this newer, you know, topics such as the carbon sequestration for us, it's incredibly important to to really be part of that verification process, kind of to Christie's point that there's. Again, there's there's a lot of people talking it, but and there's a lot of people selling it, you could say too, but there's really a lot of a lot of you know work to be done here to really truly have something that at least Santa Fe feels good that they can stand by that is a verified, in this case, carbon offset. Um, the other thing I'll kind of just you know add or kind of couple with for us, you know, the, the other big frontier, last frontier is the harvest part of this equation. So you know, we've been growing hemp since it's been, call it legal here in the United States. And every year, you know, we're improving the planting and, you know, all those different aspects. Again, cannabinoid farming being very different than industrial, but both having those similarities. It's the harvest that really is the, for us still, the, the place that we're doing a ton of work. Um, because again, we've, we've had a great harvest this year on our industrial farms but we see all the, the room for improvement. And really, I think what I'll kind of put forth in, in this conversation is the spec coming from the demand is, is today what's also missing to really form the supply chain, to really understand, you know, even something as simple as animal bedding, you're hearing people talk about, which could be an amazing, it is an amazing product, but to take it to scale is, do you need to decorticate for that or do you not? And then comes the whole thing that decortication itself 
is still a timeline as far as true scale that is you know going to cause this thing to be a little bit slower than some of us would like just in, in there absolutely Hana, I know that you you're a little bit ahead not being in the U.S. and been doing this for a little while. Do you have anything to add to what Christy or Isaac mentioned? Hana, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think like the, the 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 most important thing it's the the harvesting. I think like the growing it's kind of simple. Even like figuring out the varieties, it's not really like the the big issue. You know, sooner or later, like we will figure it out. Like the agronomy, uh, but the most like challenging part uh, it's um, it's the harvest. And I know that like US is very innovative, and I, I believe that like the innovation. Will, will will happen much faster in in the US than happening in Europe because like so far in Europe we have uh, like like few harvesters like John Deere has the harvester then we have this Deutsch Farm harvester which is the trick crop harvester which works very well it's like a really good one uh, but it uh, needs like the adjustment by the professional company to make it happen so you cannot really like buy it you need to ask the company to make it for you and it takes like nine months <laughs> to work for it yeah. and then uh, there are like some 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 other companies which making them but it's also on the request basically you cannot like buy the ham harvest uh, like going to the shop where they they have like these all professional harvesters for corn and wheat and get it you know you need to really like think ahead Okay, next year I'm going to plant hemp. How I'm going to harvest that? At the same time, we are thinking about like I'm going to order the seeds from Hannah. Okay, I also need to ask her like where I'm getting the harvester, you know, and, and how I'm going to harvest that because you are not able to harvest like not, like okay three meters like ten ten feet like high hemp stem with wheat harvester. Maybe you can like harvest like with with harvest or something like five five feet like if you ha like grow late like do sowing late and the hemp has not not enough time to grow high so then you harvest kind of like something not so tall and maybe like you can put the the harvester for wheat a little bit more up and you harvest that yeah somehow and 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 then you spend a lot of hours under the combine to take all the like stem out yeah like i did that many times so it's still like not really like you can harvest that but also question how much and how how long and and even like if you harvest like one acre does not really mean like you can harvest like 30 acres or 300 acres you know like because you know or later like these like hemp hemp uh, fiber somewhere where it's rotate something like in the in the machine will rotate on and it's like very fucking hard to get it out yeah so so uh, so you have to keep in mind yeah so even like somebody show you picture you know like oh this machine works on the field look like and like one minute video you have to ask him the question okay how long the machine was working there and he said yeah one afternoon okay but i'm going to harvest like 300 hectares I wish you like this machine will also sustain to harvest 300 hectares or acres. You know, it's it's like very different story. So, so basically, uh, the experience what I can like bring from Europe, you really need to like uh, like have like special machines for hemp. It's or like and and have them trial like not on one hectare <laughs> or acre. Yeah, you need to really like use them like couple of times, couple of seasons, you know, and, and have them approved. And this is not really happening yet in the US. So so I, I really like trying to like tell you, uh, look in Europe, there are like machines which are approved <laughs> if you don't want to fail, <laughs> but look them now because like these people maybe can bring this machine in US, but probably if you ask them in April that you want to harvest in, in 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 september or, or august you know it's not going to happen why just because the 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 the, the freight it's fucked up <laughs> and and miracles not happen overnight yes yeah? so so get ready like like you need to understand like if you want to be successful in hemp you need to understand all the value chain you need to start with the seeds 
but also you need to start with agronomy. You need to understand the harvest. You also need to understand the post harvest. Even if you harvest the seeds, but you don't know that you need to run fast to get them dry. <laughs> you fucked up the quality of the seeds and then you don't sell it. So again, you need to have like prepared the, 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 good, the, the good drying system and not the same one which, they, which dries for the wheat because wheat can, you can dry high temperature. Happy you cannot dry high temperature again, yeah? So it's like little steps, but little details, but these details make success. And, and you need to keep in mind that. And, and, and it, it's, it's not like, I wanna grow hemp and I'm going to throw like, uh, like, like I'm going to buy a container and grow it, done. It's, it's like very, I know that like American thinks a little bit like this way, like let's do it, which is sometimes very good, but sometimes you also like convince farmer to do it. But then if you don't have these steps, then like the, the bet, experience of the farmers like this happened in the cbd like how many farmers who had like bad luck with the yeah. cbd can con convince now to grow like something else this farmer will never touch hemp at all right even if you are going to talk to them like how how great is it you know so this is why i don't call this like uh, uh, uh hemp hemp is for me like grain and fiber the, the, the all like cannabinoids is low to eat marijuana that's my opinion uh, because like this is like the difference, yeah. Because the hemp it's like well treated, breeded, stabilized something which it's used for industry. Everything which is like cannabinoid profile, it happened from the marijuana. It was breeded from marijuana, so it's not hemp. <laughs> it's low THC marijuana, even you call it hemp, but it's it's like a big difference. So if we wanna really like do hemp for the farmers, we really need to describe them all the value chain and not tell them oh we will figure out later no 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 the farmer need to understand every fucking chain to be sure that he can be successful yeah and i'll jump in real quick here hannah um you know one thing we've had success with is the fact that from an agriculture standpoint you know the, this is just another crop and i think the farmers that look at it that way end up right off the bat having just initial more success. I mean, there's a lot of R and D. Don't get me wrong, but at the end of the day, you know, we're working with third generation barley farmers. It's grain is grain. So even some of the harvest equipment. I mean, to Jack's point and Jack's question, there, there's some people doing some custom stuff. We're familiar with Bishop Enterprises too. Um, we're trying to go down the lane of there's this thing is 80 to 90% just another crop and there is a 10, 20% nuance. But again, working with people that have been in agriculture for again, multi generations is where we see a lot of our, our success in really just tweaking, especially something like industrial hemp to the point cannabinoid hemp was its own thing. It's more of a boutique, you know, it is closer to row crop farming, but still it's, it's, it has a little bit more of a unique thing. The industrial hemp for us, I mean, again, not giving a secret away, but there's farmers out there that have been harvesting grain for many decades. So that's that's the other thing I'd like to add. Christy, do you have anything you want to add on there? And then I'd yeah, also, I, go ahead. Yeah, I, th I think probably, you know, one of my biggest challenges this year really truly was to help that farmer to understand the full value chain. And, and my, our best successes this year came from our farms that approach even their, even a smaller acreage crop into the rotation with this approach that this is just another crop and we're going to, we're going to attack this like just another crop. And so, you know, I, I, I frequently hear the term writing a standard operating procedures. What's the SOP, Christy, can you get us an SOP for industrial hemp in my my first question is, you know, yes, we want to get eventually to a point of SOPs, just like we are with wheat. I don't need to coach a, a farmer on how to grow wheat. They intrinsically know because of the years of experience they've had growing small grain. If he's going to add barley to his rotation, he's going to have a very small nuance, as Isaac mentioned. That's, that's where we're trying with the research that we're doing and the energy and effort that we're putting into understanding some of these systems. Um, is really to be able to just come out with that education, 
the farmer focused conversation and say, look, if you attack it this way, you will be successful. And one of the questions was, you know, are the John Deere's or the New Holland's of the world coming up with equipment? Of course they are. But we also have to recognize to specialize equipment for a specific crop, for example, um, requires a tremendous amount of capital and some type of um, economic reward for a company to do that. And so I think some of the equipment that will be specialized for industrial hemp are probably going to come out of not the giants of the world um, in terms of the equipment manufacturing, but more smaller scale like Bish and some others that have um, a tool that can easily adapt in also at a price point that makes it accessible for a farmer to do this. Right now, farms are not going on super large scale on industrial hemp. So therefore, they're, they're limiting their exposure, their financial exposure by staying relatively small scale so that we can continue to, to scale up over time as our industry matures, as our decortication plants find the regional anchors, um, th that kind of thing. So those factors, I think, are are slowly, those gears are, are really large and it barely looks like they're moving, but let me tell you, that's what's keeping it all going, right? So, um, you know, if, if you put it in that context, we still need farmers to adapt um, to or, or, or adopt this into their system. And so when I'm talking to a farmer, I'm not trying to sell him hemp seed. I'm not trying to sell him on a nutrient management plan. What I'm trying to sell him on is the concept of this is industrial hemp. This is what it can do. Here are the soil quality benefits. While our industry continues to grow and build, we are also doing some soil recovery properties here. This is a multifaceted win for farmers. And if a farmer does come up and with the question on, oh, can I get carbon credits for that? My, my response to that will always be, carbon credits is really not the goal here. And it, and it technically shouldn't be the goal. It's, it's a part of the conversation, but it shouldn't be the primary goal. Um, and, and the simple fact that until this industry is more solidified and, and more established, um, you know, in, in the supply chain and the full value chain, I don't know how we'll ever truly be able to quantify that. I did want to answer or address a question that came up in the chat about Please. some of the two, some, somebody asked about, um, um, oh gosh, now I can't even remember the, the monitoring or the carbon, you know, monitoring tools. Let me go back here. Um, Comet Farm and Soil Metrics. Um, I happen to be working with a company called Continuum Ag. You may have heard of them. Um, Mitchell Hora is the founder. Um, he had he along with um, working with a lab in in Kansas and Rick Haney himself, who developed the Haney soil testing. Um, although there isn't a technical FSA recognized hemp protocol. Um, I will tell you that I'm a part of a committee that is developing these protocols so that we can actually monitor and and measure these carbon features that industrial hemp plays a role in so that we can answer these questions in a way that isn't consumed by a brand or a company that is kind of cornering the market space on the carbon conversation. Um, so the, the, there's a lot of companies that are out there causing, um, in my opinion, maybe even a little bit of pushback from the farmers because they can't seem to get their answer straight on things. And that kind of scares the farmers a little bit. Um, working with farmers every single day, they're, they, you know, well, what's new in hemp, Christy? You know, they're looking, they're looking to me because I'm active in that space for their signal of when it's time to get in. And so I'm happy to share with them you know, the tools that you that you guys put on this farm this year would actually be great if you integrated hemp into your rotation. Um, you know, that those conversations are happening more and more and more. So I just feel like there's a lot of industry people that have great ideas, um, but we're lacking in the in the, the space of foot soldiers that can actually communicate how a farm can do this. How can they integrate that in a way that's practical, that's economical, and um, that meets their risk palette because every farm has a different level of risk that they're they're interested in, in buying into. So that's that's my two cents there. Yeah, okay, and so I'd, I'd, I'd add to, I mean, again, in the name of not reinventing the wheel, we're using a third party 
uh, software that's been in the, and again, in the agriculture space for 30 years. And the companies like that are already incorporating the carbon story, you know, so I think that's another thing I always, you know, suggest to people. There's, again, some of this is agriculture has been going on, especially in this country, very sophisticated for lots of years. So, um, you know, the other thing I'll share that I don't think we've touched on, I think Hannah mentioned a couple of things is genetics. You know, the other reality to R&D machinery is it's all designed like Christy was kind of saying, and genetics today is, again, where a lot of people have had some nightmare, <laughs> nightmare experiences because, again, genetics, as much as there's some pretty strong things in the Europe and, you know, the Canadas, there's, there's hemp grown in China. A lot of people don't have the best experiences, you know, using Chinese genetics, but that's one thing that Santa Fe's focused a big time is having that closed loop of having genetics in-house that we can keep improving and understanding the feedback loop from both the machinery that's harvesting and especially the specs coming from the market, which again, that, that takes time. I mean, breeding is a very long thing. So, you know, our, our focus was always what was in demand, which was the cannabinoid, right? But we quickly focused, you know, now we're looking at many different aspects, of course, more around the grain and the fiber story but again, some of the decortication is not there yet to really push back to us what would be a better genetic. And that's the thing that's gonna to start to really happen here. And we continue to try to do as much work as we can with the universities and pushing on our lovely government, but it's, as we all know, some things just take time. Okay, so I feel like this is my drop in. I really want to introduce Daniela, who is on the call. Daniela, I don't know, you're on mute right now, but I'd love to highlight a little bit about what you're working on and then potentially how we can collaborate or the industry can collaborate with some of the things you are working on to support some of this progress with the university. Thank you, Mandy, for the opportunity. I wasn't expecting to, to talk today. I just wanted to hear what you guys were talking about. I, uh, I am representing Cornell University. I am part of the extension program. I started October 1st, so I'm brand new. I'm coming from hardcore research at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I see some of my friends in Colorado. Hi to all of you. Um, yeah, I know. Um, so, uh, and I moved to New York State recently. My work right now is to apply the research that I've been doing and to understand the needs of those that are um, farming hemp uh, for all purposes. You know, like I completely agree uh, with uh, Hannah when you said that it's low THC marijuana. I love that term because I actually use it myself. Um, I, I completely agree with Isaac when he says, you know, like we need to start growing varieties that are useful for our environment. And I think that it's great that at Santa Fe you're doing that. Uh, Christy, I would love to connect with you because uh, I need to understand who to sell this, this hemp, who is buying it, how are they processing it? And I think that you have great ideas. I am focused in New York state. So if there's anyone in New York state that is growing, please contact me. I'm gonna be the contact information between Cornell and the research that's happening at Cornell and the farmers. So I'm basically kind of a translator. What's going on in the research and how uh, to translate it to the farmers and what do the farmers need and going back to the researchers, hey, this is what's going on in the fields. This is what people need. We need to tackle this and these questions. We need to have this type of answers. So I am kind of in between. So if there's anyone that um that uh, that is here in New York State, I'm gonna put my email on the chat. Please contact me, and then uh, if if I can contact you, uh, Christy, Hannah, and Isaac. Um, separately so I can understand more and talk with you. I would I would love to to be in touch. And thanks, Mandy, for the opportunity to introduce yeah. myself. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm excited about your experience and everything that you're bringing to the table and definitely the knowledge. Very brave. <laughs> we were talking about the move across the country and from Colorado, where you love, to, to New York, where you're going to learn to love it. Right? <laughs> Hopefully, yes, I, I, am, I am looking forward to that. Um, and I just put my email there, uh, my Cornell email address. Uh, and please, um, I would love to connect with you. So, um, so yes, Perfect. so thank you very much. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Are there any other questions that have come in? Nathan, are you raising your hand or saying thanks? 
Go yeah, ahead. I'd like to like I'd like to chime in on some of the discussion that we've had. Yeah, please. On genetics. Uh, so I live in Texas uh, down here. I, I saw there's a lot of people coming to Austin. So welcome everybody to Austin this weekend. Uh, but we found that there's only very few genetics that have actually worked in our environment at all for hemp and fiber specifically. Um, ideally, like MS77 has worked down in South Texas with Tetra Hemp Company. Uh, we've seen a little bit of work with um, A&M University. They've had uh, Yuma um, has grown okay. Um, and then the Eletta Campania from Italy. So those are really the only three, like an Australian, a Chinese, and an Italian that have not gone to flower immediately in our environment. Um, and we understand that, you know, get to the Kentucky line in North, as Hannah was saying earlier, you know, it's a whole different ball game. I know, Christy, you work up there in Michigan. So you, you guys are experimenting with a number of other varieties that just didn't work for us. And so, um, yeah, that, that'd be a real, a real big kicker, especially um, where all that goes. So you know, that's the only thing I wanted to mention on what we've seen here in Texas, and I assume would be similar for other latitudes here in South, uh, you know, 28 and South. Um, yep. but, and Nathan, uh, yeah. Nathan, real quick, was that the, the straight Yuma or the Yuma crossbow? Uh, that was actually the straight Yuma. There is another picture of the Yuma crossbow, which come from uh, Colorado uh, Hemp his, Project. Yeah, forgetting his name out of Colorado. Um, Bill Bill. Yeah. Um, uh, so that one kind of flowered a little bit early, but it's it's worked well in Kansas with Melissa and the in the group up there at South Bend. So um, you know, just you got to experiment with your particular region would be my my advice from what I've seen so far. So. Uh, Happy Speaking to be involved. Of, Thanks for having me. Thanks for sure. Thanks for joining, Nathan. Um, Melissa, I know that you had made a comment earlier to kind of speak as the processor or processing in Kansas. Do you have any feedback about your season and how things went to kind of speak? You no, know, I feel like we're back in this chicken and egg scenario of feedback to the farmer on the genetics and we can't get feedback to the processor until, you know, we've got this chicken and egg scenario, which one comes first. But if you're on, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, so what we've got is every batch of bales that have came in, we've already ran several of those farmers bales. So we're already making progressions. We're contracting with farmers for next year. There's some lines that we're gonna remove from our growers group and we're not gonna have them grow up for any more for that. Um, on the flip side, we've got manufacturers we're sending out, we keep everything separated. So we've got different varieties headed to different manufacturers. And they're doing that next level of testing to find out what variety maybe has the cellulose content they need or whatever they're looking for for their production line. They're finding some varieties are performing better. So that's what we're curtailing our growers for in 2022. Um, it's thankfully because we have the processing unit right there, we're getting feedback nearly immediately as soon as those bales come in and, and we're already looking to move forward to 2022. I love it. Love it, love it. It's been fun watching all of your success. Well, are there other questions that came in? We're at about an hour right now. I wanna be respectful of time. I wanna remind everybody to log on to the hemp hallway and create your platform. I'll, I'll have you just set sec, Hannah. Um, because you guys are on that platform, able to connect with each other outside of these meetings. The purpose of this is to help you guys grow your business and build connections. Um, I love, it's, I, it really does fuel my fire when I hear Melissa post or see Melissa post that due to our meeting, she was able to make connections or make a sale. And so for any of you that as this comes up, please let me know, share and highlight, um, get onto Hemp Hallway so you guys can connect. And then if there's anything I can do spe specifically to help advance the conversation or bring those prospects or those supply chains to the, to the table so that you have an opportunity to meet them and build relationships, please let me know. Um, Kayla, I know you're on as well. I'd love to have an update from you if you're available after Hannah. Uh, Hannah, go ahead. No, I just wanted also to keep in mind that like as like the US industry grows, that is also important to create some like breeding of these like genetics, which are like suitable for the US climate. I don't see like many breeding programs happening in different states for the hemp genetic for grain and, and fiber. So maybe this is kind of like something that feel for somebody interested and also keep in mind that like one thing is that Yuma or this like Australian genetics will work 
But again, to do the multiplication of the seeds, you need to get the rights for be able to multiply them and distribute them. Again, <laughs> I don't know if if Chinese government who owns these varieties will give you rights to do the multiplication legally in the US for these varieties. So one, one thing it's like doing the trials on the small scale, but like you don't want to ever like import those varieties uh, from China or from Australia. And as I said, Australia is 1% THC. So again, you will need at least like do some adaptation or selection to decrease to 0.3 or if you hope for government going up 1%, good luck with that. We did it actually this year in US, uh, in Czech Republic. So maybe in US you can do it as well. I will wish you big, big luck with that. But uh, it's also like the part of the, of, the, of the growing, the hemp industry have like stable genetic in US. And it's, um, I, I don't see like much work on that, which is surprising me. So maybe somebody who want to put his effort in hemp industry can, and it's like more on the like R&D can take this way. I would recommend that. Okay, I like it. So I'm just gonna real quick put this out there. Uh, Global Hemp Association is forming, actively working on a dominant farmer support group to provide education, resources, tools, a, a platform to connect, a regular face-to-face -face education across the nation and partnering up with other organizations that are doing this. And so I would love actively to have as many of you involved. Um, at our advisory meeting this next week, we will be forming a committee. Um, there's a lot of you that are involved in the association as well as involved in other groups. Again, I do not want to recreate something that's already happening, but support it. So your feedback for us as to where we can really aid also on the grant and re research side, right? Um, we've got a group, we are a nonprofit, and I'd love to be able to support you guys in some of this and link up arms. Um, and so I'm just gonna put that out there. Marianne, I see your arm is, your hand is raised, I guess. I am volunteering for that process, girlfriend. Perfect. That is my sweet spot bringing the farmers together for themselves to be able to share their resources, their knowledge, their tr trials and tribulations and their joys and successes. This is so important. And when we establish that, then we can also draw in the outside world to be more interactive and understand what farmers go through and what they're doing every day. Uh, that is just phenomenal. Yes, and that's so. not only in hemp, you know, it's, it's all growing in, in, in my world. So yes. thank you. If you will reach out to me, uh, I will give whatever support I can. Okay. Absolutely. I love it. I really appreciate it. Um, Kayla, I don't know if you're on, I don't know if we want to open up our next farming's meeting. I'm going to host these on a monthly basis every month with the intent to provide the connectivity and education farmer focused. But with the farming group, we also have an R&D and emerging technologies that also addresses a lot of our farming. And so don't hesitate to share, invite. Our farming membership to the association is um, our least expensive membership with the intent that they deserve the most support. And I don't want to cut back. Now, farming membership, when I say most support, I don't know if that's fair because I probably need more support than the rest of you. But <laughs> I... Um, I it's really important that we we give them the resources so that we can make this successful because without the farm we won't have the manufacturing and so forth so kayla do you have anything you want to add i'd love to highlight and if you want to share a little bit about what we're working on on the initiative or farm side feel free um so i you know you mentioned him hallway um a little while ago i'm really excited to connect with a lot of you on there um feel free to send me a message in him hallway uh, that's a great way to get a conversation started. Um, and, and it's a very focused area for me. So when people are messaging me there, like that gets a lot of my attention. So, um, I, I, I'm working on a lot of things with Mandy. Uh, we, we are, uh, evolving a lot of very quick projects, very, efficiently and in hemp hallway soon you guys will see uh, mandy i don't know if you would like to show the area real quick of where these sure. uh projects are going to exist uh because i think that uh, keeping an eye on that's going to be really important for everybody who's here uh there's a lot of of really 
really important things that you might be thinking of working on and you'll see a project pop up there and you'll be like, oh, wow, this has already been done. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Here's a collaborative opportunity for me to become a part of or bring my expertise or become a part of this. So uh, that's something that's really exciting uh, for me about Hemp Hallway is we have this opportunity to, to bridge the gap with the resources between each other. Okay, so this is for those of you that have just logged in or have not logged in before, this is our home page. When I stream live in the mornings, it will stream light, live right here as well. So that makes it nice. But in our projects and, and member benefits, as you guys have specific projects you're working on, you can actually post it here. And then it allows you to control who is invited or is able to see this. So if you're raising capital or if you have uh, a media, media event or a, a project that you want other people involved in, you can go ahead and add it here. And then on the events page, this is awesome too. If you guys have specific groups or specific meetings that you guys are hosting to bring people together, you can post them here, keep them private and do private invites or publish them publicly so that anybody can attend. But you can search all of our different events that are coming up here on this. And then of course, on our hemp hallway, I see we've got quite a few more people that have logged in today or logged in recently. We're at almost 3000 people that have been logged into the profile or into the portfolio. And you can search throughout the world um, who people are. And then once you click on them, it gives you an opportunity to actually connect with them and send them a message. So feel free to use this, um, especially as we see people here. And I think another really key point um, as we're building this up is within our media center. For those of you that missed meetings or had to log off early or have questions about past content, you can come in here and search any of our networking or, or past meetings that we've hosted. You can even search them by title um, and it will pull up past content trans transcript notes and then utilize that to build those relationships and connect. So there you have it. And there's Mandy. I always like to, to throw out there that there's always, there's over 400 hours of content and growing. I think it'll probably hit 500 hours of content here pretty soon. Um, but I always like to point that out to people. It's a stat that when the first time I heard you say it, I was floored. And as a researcher, it's great to know that there's so, so much high quality content available um, just right at my fingertips. So yeah, thanks for showing that off. Awesome. Thanks. I feel like so many of us have seen it so many times. And so it becomes a spot where I, so just stop me if I ever do, because I eat, breathe and sleep this. And mainly because I can't believe the connections that have been formed through the platform. And, and again, outside of our meetings, now you have a tool to further this and move this along. Um, anything else, Christy, that you'd like to add? Isaac, I don't see, I don't know if you're still on. Did you get booted? Or are you still there? But anything you'd like to add, Christy? Just want to make sure I was unmuted. Sorry. Um, yeah. Th thanks again for for your interest in you know and giving me a, an opportunity to share a little bit what we're learning. Obviously, there's really great quality people working in this space. Um, I feel like the bar continually gets raised as far as the quality of information that's coming out. Also, the even though our community is growing, I feel like the the people that are really committed to this are getting much more laser focused on how to bring good information to the farmers. And um, there's there's some interesting collaborations that are in, in that blossoming phase right now that I think stay tuned um, on, on the, the actual agronomic components of growing this so we can solve those questions for farmers. Um, on the genetic side of this, there's some really, really interesting things that just continue to pop out out of there and, and really getting uh, varietals tuned in for our latitudes that we're growing in our, our, our nuances that we can grow. Um, and, and I think that, you know, as you mentioned, this, this space to be able to collaborate has just been phenomenal. I thank you all. And um, if you want to connect with me personally, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on so all the social media platforms and I'm happy to, uh, happy to answer your questions. So. And Christy, let's get you into the hemp hallway so we can have a real collaborative uh, opportunity over there that's super, we'll get even more laser focused and dialed in uh, by having that, that in tune area. I'm, to excited. I'm excited about it because the opportunity for discussion. That's, you know, yeah. to, be able to make the discussion in the chats and provide a forum where we can, you know, dive into future questions, um, which reminds me, Ch Tim, I don't know if you're still on. There was a question you had this morning as we were going over some of the tests and lab work. 
Uh, let me see. I don't know if I still see him on. He was asking about different chemicals. I'll send you over an email intro because he had some good questions this morning about uh, tests and labs for the drift crop, the drift, um, I guess, what am I trying to say? Not drift crop, but when the, the pesticides or fertilizers are spreading Drifting on other crops. There you go. Yeah. And so, like, so residue testing. I don't know what it would be called, but yes, they're finding that they're not crop dusting. Where is that? Who is that? Is that Tim? Jerome crop dusting. He's oh. talking about the crop dusting this one, the residuals from crop dusting. Yeah. And being able to test those correctly um, or know to test them or request them. So the, was his question oriented to what, what labs does he use for that or what tests does he ask for? Uh, I think that the question came up that the requirement is to test for what might be harmful in, in your crop and then understanding the crops that are around you due to the drift. Um, so there's a few organizations um, that have begun these type of disclosure sort of apps. Um, I know Drift Watch is a great one and that was originated um, with the orientation of protecting bees. And so when there's hives out or it's heavy pollinating season or whatever, um, and you have like a, a farm near you that requires bees, but a farm adjacent to it that wouldn't, would spray an insecticide that could potentially harm those bees. So the, the concept was to, you know, kind of self-register on this app to say, hey, I have this. Um, but right now, there, those, the disclosure of that information is very difficult to convince farmers that they need to do that. And so we see it even exclusive of the hemp space, but say, for example, I have a potato farm next to a, a peas, a farm that's growing peas that are organic. Um, so the organic world has sort of adapted that as well, saying, hey, we're an organic farm, don't spray, or let us know when you're going to be spraying certain pesticides that could potentially contaminate our crop for, re you know, harmful residues. Um, there's an absolutely ridiculously large list of harmful pesticide residues. <laughs> um, so depending on what harmful may actually be considered, um, I think it's very important in the um, in the low THC marijuana space. <laughs> I like how that was phrased earlier. <laughs> um, I think that that's because that's a, a directly consumable product. I think that there's the dunamis is on the grower to prove that this doesn't have any kind of contaminations. And that, that uh, requirement or that suggestion isn't yet a requirement in certain states, um, you know, for, for different things. So there's, there's a lot of questions that I would have to ask that person back to get to the bottom of what they're really trying to understand. So if you can come across whoever that is, I'm happy to, to jump in and, and help connect them with resources to get those questions answered. I'll send you an email intro. Tim was on a call. He was just on. So it looks like he probably just jumped off when I told him we were going to log off in an hour <laughs> so, or at the hour. So, well, if there aren't any other questions, I want to get a huge thank you again. Um, Bill, I know that you had some questions previously about some different uh, pesticides or fertilizers that were being used that are actually killing the crops. Um, Christy and Melissa both are great, great to address or to talk to about that. Please don't hesitate to reach out. There's a lot of you that are on this call. Thank you very much. If you're not a member of GHA, we'd love your support. Join at globalhempassociation.org or on the hemp hallway. And if there's, again, anything we can do or any topic specifically that you are looking to learn about or companies you're looking to meet, individuals, please let us know. And I will do my best to make the connections.